Hi, I thought I'd take this opportunity to give you a demo of the Studer A810. This particular machine is going to be up for sale pretty soon, but it's also a really nice chance to see what the Studer A810s are like and to do, as Doug Mayer would say, a tour of the quirks and features in this machine. And there are plenty of nifty features and interesting quirks. So this particular machine, in fact, came from the NBC Radio Network, or NBC Net Radio, as well as the two others that will be up for sale fairly soon. And if you're familiar with A810s, you might notice something that's a bit odd. The meter bridge is kind of in the wrong place. The reason why it's up there is that the in the original NBC Studios, I believe they had this and the two other matched meter bridges stacked on top of each other. So they would just have a row of three meter bridges, all connected to three matched A810s. And then there's an A820, which was the mastering machine that I believe dubbed down to these three A810s. So there's some interesting history in this machine, and who knows what's been recorded on here. It's, it's again, part of the Ra NBC Radio Network. These came to me through a community college where NBC donated them. Uh, they donated them to the community college when NBC Net Radio basically was discontinued. NBC got rid of the radio network. And there they sat in storage for many, many years. And then they just made their way to me. So it was basically they could have been in the... They, they fortunately were rescued from the trash. But they didn't work. So... Once I got them, they went through a pretty big overhaul. All of the capacitors have been replaced. In fact, here are all of the capacitors that have been replaced. Lots and lots of them. The Phillips capacitors in particular, these guys, were pretty iffy. One of them exploded on me while I was working on this. So that has all been repaired, and yeah, so let's go and take a look at this cool, cool machine. We've got our meter bridge up top, and there are a number of different variations of A810s. One of the most common ones is the portable version. It's not very portable, where the two meters are actually down here where these blank panels are, and underneath the blanking panels are a series of holes where you can add in other uh, controls. For instance, there's a very speed recorder, or a very speed uh, 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 tool that could go down here, and that would adjust the speed of the mechanism. Another one that's another optional module that's available is this guy. This is the time code reader and recorder. So these units have the time code reader. They have the meters up here, blanking panels down there, and then a nice speaker for previewing. I really like that speaker, actually. It sounds surprisingly good for being kind of just a, honestly, sort of a cheapo little speaker. Then we've got our tape transport mechanism, or controller, down here. And over here are the speed controls. So these are really nice. These are four-speed units. So they go from a low end of 3.75 inches per second all the way up to a really zippy 30 inches per second. And then we have our actual tape transport here. So we have our take-up reel, and we've got our heads down here underneath a secret door, and then the nifty transport mechanism. We'll see that in more detail in just a little bit. And then your reels themselves use Cine uh, spindles, and if you want to use a 10.5-inch reel, then there are hub adapters for NAB or NAB reels that can go on there. All right, so let's get into the actual unit itself, and we'll do that by turning it on. Turn it on, it goes through a little thing down here. It tells you the calendar week and year of the operating system, and it goes through a boot process, and now we're ready to go. The time code is at zero minutes, zero seconds. And we're ready to start using this. So we'll start this by loading the tape that, that is the only tape that came with this. It was from the community college and it's got a bunch of students in various tracks playing. Now this is 
a half track machine. So it won't play your consumer reel to reel tapes. Those are quarter tracks, and quarter tracks have four audio tracks per uh, uh, divided into the tape. This is just some feeder tape. Okay, it just keeps falling off. So this would be divided into four. In the case of this machine, though, it's a half track. So the tape is one way only, and there are two tracks on here. So this is split halfway down the middle. One track's on this side, one track's on the other side. There's actually not exactly halfway because there's also a time code track. So now, because this started spooling off, I'm going to wind this back up and destroy the tape in the process. And let's wind this back up. And carefully. All right, I'm going to put on our seven inch take up reel here. Somehow get that on there. There it is. We snap the little tab out. There you go. So now it's locked in place. So now we have to wind this onto the transport mechanism. So this is we go around here and around here and then we flip up the magic door. So we go around there and then back around here. Let's just wind out a little bit of tape. And so I like to use feeder. So I just leave a little section of it out. And let's take this up. You can hear the brakes squeaking. All right, now it's ready to go. So our tape is on there. I left a fair bit of that out. So we're going to start off by just hitting play. Put our door back down. Let's hit play a little bit. And we've got audio, but I can't hear anything. And that's because this input, rather the speaker, the monitor is set to input and not tape. So I'm going to turn the volume down. Let's set it to tape. We have it set to channel one and channel two. Again, this is a two track machine. I'm going to turn the volume up. All right, it wasn't recorded at this speed, so let's stop. <laughs> bring it down, let's bring it down to 15 IPS. Give that a try. Yeah. Maybe it's at seven and a half. <laughs> All right, sounds great. We've got two different tracks. Let's listen to track channel one. And, and as I said, I'm a makeup artist, and I'm looking for my makeup bag the next day. <laughs> okay. All right, let's try channel two. I got nothing now. All right, so let's fast forward a little bit. And we can actually cue. Yeah, there we go. Sounds really good. It was on channel one. Channel two is getting pegged. So this is where we start getting into the levels. This is currently set to what the uh, default values are, the calibrated values. And the calibrations are written down inside of here. We'll see that in a little bit. So this is recorded a bit hot. So let's set the reproduction level down a little bit lower. There we go. That's a bit better. So these buttons, the uncal buttons, switch back and forth between switch back and forth between a calibrated level, which is preset to a certain dBV, or whatever you want to do with these knobs. All right, so now we're listening to the tape. Now let's get down into some of the cool stuff here with this controller. Uh, let's just fast forward past this track. Fast forwards very nicely. Somehow we're listening to the same thing. All right, so we have him saying, and good evening again. I'm going to wheel back a little bit. 
All right. So I'm going to set the timer here to zero. All right. So the timer has been reset. Let's hit play. And good evening again, ladies and gentlemen. And welcome to All right. Northern Virginia Community College. And now let's hit uh, zero loc. What, what zero location will do is it's going to take us back to that zero spot. And watch this. This is cool. And now, and good evening again, ladies and gentlemen. Now, Welcome to so we had to hit play, Northern Virginia but it went right back to where we were before. Now watch this. I'm going to hit zero loc and hit play at the same time. This time, when it gets down to zero, it'll just automatically start to play. Good evening again, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to and it's going back to the same spot every time, which is so cool. Now, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to give it a location. So there are two location memories. You've got your zero location where it can go back to zero on the timer. And then you have location one and location two. So let's set that by hitting trans and loc one. That is there. I don't know. Don't know what he was saying. We'll find out. Let's hit loc one and play. Ah, pretty cool. All right, and now let's let this let's cue forward a little bit. All right, we've got some music. So relaxing. Three, four. All right, that's location two now. Now let's go jump back to location one. I'll hit play. Again, cues it up. And, uh, there we go. There's our in the department the line. And department. now let's go to location two. Ah, pretty neato. And the last button that's pretty cool is the location start button. So what this does, I'm going to go back to location one first. We've got this playing. Blah, 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 blah. There he goes. So now he's chatting again. I'm going to fast forward. I'm going to pick a random spot here. 136. I'm going to hit location start. So what that does is that's going to go back to exactly where we just stopped. So it remembers, location start is where you last hit play or you last hit stop. So we'll go, now I'm going to hit location one. It's going to get confused again. It's going to bring itself back. Now let's hit location start. Now is when it goes back to 136. So, location start is where you last hit play, or you last hit stop, I believe. Location two is our spot at 2.23, and location one is back where he was talking. And then zero location is just back to the zero point of our timer. The last button to show you is lifter and I'm going to barely use this because it's not too good on the heads but lifter let me set it to fast forward lifter actually takes the tape and moves it down on the head while it's spooling so you can hear the audio if you wanted to cue then you would take the lifter and lower it down so you can actually hear what's going on we also have the transport button so like I mentioned when you press transport with location one or location two then that records the location one or location two section, uh, settings. But you can also change the speed of the uh, transport mechanism. So let's hit fast forward and let's slow it down. So now it's set to a slower loading speed or queuing speed or what have you. Turn it off, turn it back on slow it down again. 
So if you're really looking for something, this is where you really want to use the lifter to find out what's happening. Okay. We can do the same thing on the other in the other direction. So it goes one way. Just down. If I turn it off. So then I can make it go in the other direction. Make it go slower. This is particularly helpful when you're rewinding to the start of the tape, by the way, so you don't have it go off the machine. That sounds pretty cool. So let's rewind the tape and get prepared to do some recording. One thing I can do is hit zero loc. Stop it. I'm gonna hit zero loc so that it brings us back to the almost the start of the tape. And it will stop there as opposed to having the tape spool off the end of the reel. Alright, except I put zero location much further back and much further down the edge of the tape. But that's okay. Keep rewinding. As we get closer. I'm going to slow it down a little bit. There we go. And we'll take it off. And we'll put on our blank tape. All right, I've loaded the tape on, and I'm going to cue this up to where we've got tape showing up over the heads. Let's bring it out a little bit past there. There we go. I'm going to set that to my zero mark. So my tape has been cued, and now I need to give it something to listen to. So I'm going to play a track of my own. My apologies for you having to listen to my own music, but it avoids any DMCA takedown notices. So I'm gonna hit play on my track. My track is set up to uh, zero decibels, or the zero mark should uh, be equivalent to the same voltage inputs. All right, oh, I don't have anything on the meter, so it's a little hard to see the meters in this light. But the reason why is that I'm not actually looking at the signal coming in. So I'm gonna set the signal, uh, I'm gonna set these meters to the input, by pressing the blue button. There we go. So my levels look pretty good, but let's say they didn't. I can set this, turn off the uncal here. I can set this to uncalibrated and adjust the levels as I need to. And we can still hear it coming through the big speakers on the playback system that's not here. Now let's turn the volume up. And the input volume up. So this is coming now through here. All right, I'm going to set it back to calibrated. There we go. So I'm almost ready to record. But what I do need to do is make it ready to record. I can't hit record. Well, I can, but it's not going to record anything because my tracks are not uh, allowed to record. I don't have it in ready mode. It's in safe mode. So safe mode means you can't record. So let's reset our timer. Whoops. Let's not hit reset, but we're going to leave it there. So we're going to hit reset and set ourselves to the zero mark, a new zero mark. And we're going to be ready to record by hitting the ready button. We're also going to turn on the time code by hitting ready. 
And now we're going to hit ready on this channel. So it's ready to go and I can hit record and play and it will start to record. So let's play our track. And it's recording. We're currently recording at seven and a half IPS. Stop that. Let's stop the track first. And now let's hit stop here. And let's go back to our zero mark. And when we play this back, we're going to listen to Repro. And listen to the tape here as well. That sounds great. <laughs> that sounds really good. Now let's say I wanted to fade in uh, another track. This is the lifter for the erase head. And what this is used for is if you want to mechanically fade in another track. So we're going to go back to zero again. I'm going to set this up. This is still set up for record. Set our inputs again, and I'm going to play the another part of this track. Let's see here, and I'm going to cue it in automatically, or rather, I'm going to cue it in manually. So watch this. Now it's going to be a little hard to do because it's just going to jump levels. But what do you do? All right, so I'm going to record. Alright, so I have the erase turned off, and now I'm going to slowly bring this down. Now if I go for a second. Stop this, and stop this. Let's go back to zero. So what we should hear is the new audio slowly fading in over the old audio. It, it, it did fade. And that was because I held this lifter down over the erase head. So that's pretty neat. And if you were better at this than I am, then you'd be able to make that work a little bit better. All right, so let's fast forward a little bit and recording at another speed. I'm going to reset the timer again. And now we're going to record at 30 IPS. So because it's at 30, this is actually a different recording level. 30 and 15 are at, uh, I believe, was it plus 6? And then 7.5 and 3.75 are at minus 10. I, I don't recall. I'll put it up at the bottom of the screen for the actual notes. So now we're recording at 30. And let's play. It's one of the quieter sections.
go back to zero. And play that back. Do it on repro again. You hear it coming through the speakers. Playing back at 30 RPS. That sounds so nice. <laughs> So there you go. That is that is a cool, cool machine. The only other thing of note about this machine is it's got a uh, little splice block there if you want to splice your tapes, which I'm not going to demonstrate. This black piece right here, uh, there are optional knife cutters that can go in there that will actually slice the tape for you. This particular one is missing the Studer badge that goes here. Uh, there are some slices into the panel and the blinking panel and also the tape speed controller and that came from the NBC folks using this machine probably in haste uh, back in the day. So yeah. Oh, I haven't shown you the back of the machine. Why don't I do that? So back here we have XLR connectors, balance connectors for Audio channel 1, audio channel 2, input, output, channel 2, input, output, then time code, input, and output. And then we have our connections for the VU meter and uh, the, I believe this is for the tape deck controller. That's, up there. That's also part of the meter bridge. And a connector for remote control. There's a dude that's making a nifty remote control uh, adapter for these. It's very, very cool and it just uses a cable box remote. And then we have a ground link here that you can use to ground the device. Standard AES power cord. There are some jumper switches in here to adjust settings. You can read about those in the manual. The manuals are readily available online, which is nice. And can't really see, but this is the NBC tag for NBC Net Radio and a serial number for it. So very nifty. I hope, oh wait, you know, I can tilt this and blind you. There we go. That right there is the NBC tag. Huh? Huh? Pretty cool. Pretty cool. So there you go. That is a quick overview of a Studer A810 and if you're interested in buying this hopefully this also illustrates that the machine works and it works very nicely and all the capacitors have been replaced the only ones that have not been replaced are the big Freco power capacitors the ones that are this big and uh, there seems to be a lot of disagreement or, or confusion as to whether they should be replaced it sounds like you're better off keeping those originals in there and not uh, replacing them if there's nothing wrong. So that's what I've gone with because the, apparently the modern replacements are not that good and the originals last for a really, really long time. I think folks have gotten confused with these capacitors and I'll show you what I'm talking about. These guys, these gold Rifa capacitors, they go bad and can destroy the machine. So every single one of those have been replaced. And by the way, when I did do this, hopefully you can see that each part, each board that these came out of 
has been labeled in a baggie. So if you want to know what came out of 1.810.740.81, which is, uh, I believe, the Transport Supply Control Board. I don't recall off the top of my head. Um, these are the caps that came from there. Uh, similarly, these are the caps that came from 1.810.700.81. This is, I believe, the uh, back plane. Uh, they call it the chassis support board or something like that. I, I don't recall. And we've got these 1820-7483. Uh, this, I believe, is the uh, line amp. Oh, speaking of which, I haven't shown you what's in the magic box. I'll show you that. And we need to get those screws out. So to do that, we need the 2.5 millimeter Allen key, Allen wrench. So we loosen that. It doesn't come out. It just stays inside. It's, it's caged in there. I'm going to do this one. It pops up. And now we can lift this up. And it's got a latch here. Lift it up all the way. And now I'm going to readjust the camera so you can see it a bit better. All right, now that we can see this a bit better, I can add a little bit of light to this as well. So up here you have instructions for what everything is down underneath here. And this is it. This is actually where most of the magic is actually happening. The A10s are computer controlled. So we have a set of modules that are plugged into a backplane. All right, so let's walk through these units. On the left, we have the MP unit. Now this is the microprocessing unit. This is where the battery is. And that battery goes bad and can cause some real hassle. So I've replaced the battery on this one. This is where the memory is stored and uh, stores all the settings and the configuration for the device. Next is the tape deck controller. And that's effectively what's controlling the motion of the two motors. So the top here is play forward and peak speeds for the supply motor. motor. And then the take up reel is controlled by the lower ones. Next is the big one, the periphery controller. That's where we change the levels of the recording. Um, or what we set for the calibrated levels. So this is actually pretty interesting to see. I'm going to put it into uh, reproduction mode for channel one. So I hit channel one and level repro. I'll pop this back down. And you can see on the screen now, it says AAA 22. Well, the only thing we care about is 22. And that is a hex value that I can move up and down and you can't see the screen, so I'm going to try to lower this and keep my fingers in there. And now, hopefully, you can see the screen, and I'm raising this. You can see it's actually going through hex, lowering it down. Nine, A, B, C, D, E, F, 30. So these are hex values for each of these settings. I'll bring this back up. There we go. I'm not going to store what I just did, but if I wanted to, I'd hit the store button. We can switch over to channel two. So these are the reproduction levels, the treble level, the bass level, then the level for recording, treble level for recording, and bias. And on these post-its are all of the settings that were used to calibrate this machine. So in both cases, zero VU is set to 1.23 volts peak to peak. And on the 30 and 15 IPS, it's set to plus 6 dBm. And then these are the hex values that were configured for everything. And the way that's done is with an oscilloscope and a uh, frequency generator. So there's instructions online for how to do this if you want to try to do it yourself. But 
there's also instructions in the manual on how to how to do it. You've got a set of make a few cables to be able to do it as well. So for our 30 and 15 IPS speeds, this has been set to 355 nano Webers per meter, which is a measurement of magnetism. And that used this MRL tape. If you ever need to get one for yourself, if you buy this machine, for instance, that's 299-001-512-119. I just read it out loud for no reason. And then we've got the same thing over on the left side for speeds three and three quarters and seven and a half. And this is set to plus three dB. All right. And that's a, a lower amount of magnetism. The reason why is that you really, for consumer grade tapes or consumer speeds, which would be seven and a half and three and three quarters, you don't use the same input volume as you do for pro grade things at 15 and 30. So this is sort of the best balance between being able to play something you might buy at seven and a half IPS versus something you'd buy uh, a pre-built, pre-made tape, a pre-recorded tape at 15 IPS. If you are one of those folks who might go out and buy a master tape. All right, so moving on, we have our code units, code rewrite unit and code delay unit. And finally, let's take a look at the four modules that are here. You'll notice that they are the same over here. It's because we've got two sets, one for each channel. We have our line amplifier. This is line in. Then we have our reproduction or reproduce amplifier in this case. So that's the playback heads amp. Then we have our record amplifiers. So it goes into the record head, then high frequency drivers. So this one says, has a sticker on there that might have been original. I don't know that said high distortion. I did not find any distortion when I was working on this. And it might be because the capacitors have been replaced. So perhaps replacing those caps got rid of the high frequency distortion that was, that could have shown up on this channel at some point. But that's about it. If you want to learn how to work on one of these, the A810 service manual is readily available online. It's actually the owner's manual. The owner's manual has both the service manual and uh, owner information in here. And these are incredibly well made. This machine sounds absolutely great. I'm going to be kind of sad to see it go. It went through a full restoration. You should have seen what it looked like before. I'll Maybe I'll put some pictures up of the restoration that it went through. And yeah, that's it. This is an A810, and it is an amazing, amazing machine. And this one has a little bit of history, which is pretty cool. So I hope this was interesting or useful or something. Okay, bye.